Good evening. Welcome to New Testament Bible Study. Here we are at Cleveland Community Chapel. Chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians as we work our way through here verse by verse. Chapter by chapter. Line upon line. Precept upon precept. Every jot and every tittle. I say that because uh, you hear folks say a lot of times, uh, well, everybody kind of feels that way. Even me. I, I hate to hear preachers, especially when they sound like they're begging for money, you know. And <clears throat> Paul's not begging for money, but at the same time, when you do a Bible study like I do on Sunday night or Wednesday night, it forces you to deal with stuff that you might not normally deal with. You know, you, you don't get to pick and choose. You've got to just come to whatever the next verse is. And we're in Genesis on Sunday night, Corinthians on uh, Wednesday nights now, but uh, we come to a section where... Uh, Paul's been dealing with, in this letter to the Corinthians, this ch church that's full of problems, and he's been dealing with some of their problems and scandals and all this stuff. Now remember, these were people that came out of a pagan cult, we'd call it, and they've become Christians. And they brought a lot of baggage into the church with them, and they're just learning how to be Christians. And that's why Paul's having to write these letters to them. And while Paul's dealing with stuff that he's heard about, their cliques and divisions and sex scandals and all that kind of stuff, and now we've come to a section, the last chapter or two and tonight too, that it looks like to me that Paul's responding to a letter that we don't have, maybe that they wrote to Paul, and then Paul's answering some of these questions. And in the first verse of chapter 9, it looks like his apostleship has been questioned, so he's going to deal with that. And so it's, here we are, verse 1, chapter 9. Am I not an apostle? <laughs> See, I think that's one of the questions they've had about his apostleship. Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Which is one of the definitions I've heard of what an apostle actually is. That was someone who had actually seen Jesus Christ. Paul saw him on the road to Damascus in his glorified form, didn't he? right before he struck him blind for a few days. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. He said, look around at your church. You know, how did you become Christians? My answer to them that do examine me, see, it's a little defensive here, ain't it? People is examining questioning his apostleship. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and drink? Now, reading between the lines in the next few verses, I'm, I'm thinking that somebody said something to him up there at the church, and maybe it's got back to Paul, that uh, he's just after your money. <laughs> Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife? Which, by the way, Paul says here, the Bible says here, that an apostle has a right to have a wife. And then he mentioned some that already do, even though Paul didn't. As well as other apostles. We can have wives just like other apostles. And as the brethren of the Lord, the Lord's brothers, technically half-brothers, right? And Cephas, or, or Peter, these are married men. Or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? Now see here, Barnabas and Paul have been up there and they've got this church founding, founded and the we, we know that, you know, Paul usually when he went, what did he do? He, he worked two jobs. He was bivocational. They made tents during the day to support themselves, and then they worked at the church to, to build up the church and preach the gospel. Now, the first three and a half years I was a pastor under the Methodist system, I worked at Olin and I pastored a church. And I always, even back then and still do, feel like any, any preacher that works on a public job and the church job is a slap in their face to call them part-time, but that's what they called us back then. We were part-time, and it ain't part-time. It's You've got two full-time jobs is what that amounts to. So he said, we had the power to forbear working, but he's going to find out he didn't use it. They contended to make tents and build the church, and there was a special circumstance going on here. Paul didn't want to be a hindrance to the gospel with these folks that he was winning out of the pagan cults and, and them having the, am, dev, the devil having the ammunition of saying, he's just after your money. But he's going to set out some guidelines that are really the Lord's guidelines here about how the Lord finances the church and pastors. And it's the Lord's plan. And then Paul's going to say, but I didn't use that for this very reason. 
but it is the way it, it goes out. He, had, he said, we had the right to forbear to not work a, a public job. I'm going to give you some simple math. This is kind of astounding when you think about it. It takes 10 Christians under the Lord's plan, 10 Christians, faithful Christians, to finance a pastor at the same income level that those 10 Christians have. You ever think about that? That's just math, ain't it? If 10 Christians are tithing, it takes 10 Christians to finance the pastor at that same income level. If you got 10, that's that. And then, the, then as you build, uh, if you got 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 100, or 1,000, then that above and beyond, then you can finance a building and a church and missions and all the other stuff that goes along with it. But it takes the original 10 to finance the pastor to start with. And a lot of people don't ever think about this, but did you know that... Uh, I know you know this, but a lot of people don't ever think about it. They think there's no expense to having a church. This building is a lot bigger than my house, <laughs> bigger than most of our houses here, I guess. And it, it costs money. You have to pay a light bill every month. It costs money to heat and cool, do not it? It costs money for uh, air conditioning, heat and air units. we got $20,000 worth in these heat and air units here. You know, it takes a, uh, you got to pay insurance to protect your building. All the stuff, you know, stuff tears up, holes in the roof, and all this kind of stuff falls out. That's the maintenance part of it. So you got the pastor, and you got the maintenance part of it, and then you got the missions part of it, and, and everything else that you do, the Sunday school books, and all the, all the other stuff all factors into that. And the Lord's got a way of financing that. It's called tithing. And, Paul, and they're accusing Paul that he's just wanting their money, but Paul's going to say, this is how it works now. He's going to give us a bunch of examples, verse 7. First of all, his example is he's going to give three examples from the, the world in which they lived and we live. Who goes a warfare at any time at his own charges? Now, we don't expect our soldiers, our military, to go in the war somewhere and they have to, somebody from home have to send their own lunch and they have to provide their own tents and their own clothes and all this kind of stuff, right? They may have done that in the Civil War, but. Not any, anymore, and it didn't back in Paul's days. It said, who, who would think of it that you send a soldier into warfare at his own expense? Number two, he says, who plants a vineyard and doesn't eat of the fruit from it? <laughs> so he's making these illustrations about the church, ain't he? But it's using the examples from the world. Or who feeds a flock? And don't, we say, drink of the, of the milk of the flock. So three examples from life, but he's not through. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law. In other words, he's going to say, I gave you just in that last verse three examples from every ordinary everyday life, ordinary day life. And now I'm going to go to another example. He said, I'm going to take you to the Bible, the law of Moses. For it says the same thing, verse 9, for it is written in the law of Moses. And I think this is back from Deuteronomy. Just a little verse that says, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. And you say, well, that's a funny... Well, you, you think of an old ox back then that they was putting on a pole and turning the wheel or going around and around and around and they're grinding out the corn and the, the Bible says, Don't muzzle that ox. As the corn falls and some up spills to the side, he's working. Let him eat a little bit as he goes. But Paul's going to say, God didn't put that in there just because he cared about oxen. He said it was an example about us in the church. He don't care just about oxen, but about us too. Does God take care for oxen? Or saith it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written. That he that plows should plow in hope, and that he should thresh it, that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. Verse 11. Paul's talking about him and Barnabas now, right? If we've sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we'll reap your carnal things? And to paraphrase it, he says, if we teach you the word of God, spiritual truths, is it a big deal that you help us make a living? <laughs> if others be partakers of this power over you, or not we rather, but then he's, after he lays all that groundwork about he's just after your money, he says, we had the right to do all this. This is God's design, God's plan. But then he says, but nevertheless, me and Barnabas didn't do it when we was there. We've not used this power, but we suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. 
If, if it was going to be a stumbling block to some of those pagans coming out, and they, he said, we'll just make tents during the day. Do you not know that they which minister about, and he's not through with examples though, he's going to give Jewish examples now, he's going to take them in their minds to the temple in Jerusalem. Do you not know that they which minister about the holy things live of the things of the temple? The priest would eat the showbread after so many days, put new on there. They'd eat parts of the sacrifices that were brought. That's God's design, right? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. That's the bottom line, ain't it? But then once again, he quickly says, but I didn't use that power. But I've used none of these things. Neither have I written these things that it should be so done unto me. He says, I'm not begging for your money. He says, this is God's design, but if somebody's saying I was in it for the money, I want you to know that I didn't take your money. For it were better for me to die than any man should make my glory and void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He said, I don't have to be paid to preach the gospel. I've got to preach the gospel. And I believe that's true to any person today who's called to preach to, that you've just got to preach the gospel. And I can give you lots of examples about that. I know preachers that have pastored churches and things for years, and then they'll, they'll get out of the mint, but they'll, they'll find some way to get the preach out of them. Some of them do a radio program or some newsletter or something. There's got to be something, if you're called to preach, that you've still got to get it out of you. When we were at the old building, we built our first stage before we put the carpet on it. We, we wrote Bible verse. Everybody come up and wrote, just scribbled a, a favorite Bible verse on that stage. And I scribbled mine right here where I stand in front of the pulpit. And I scribbled on there, Jeremiah 20, verse 9. And it says, His word in my heart was as a fire in my bones that couldn't be shut up. And, and that's how it is, I think, when people are called to preach. You've got to preach. You'll find somewhere to get the preach out of you. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. And Paul was doing it willingly. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then, since he did it willingly? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. See, it's a special situation for him. There's first generation Christians and he says I didn't want to abuse it and let him, the devil use that handle that he's just after your money for though I be free from all men yet I've made myself servant unto all it's a paradox isn't it? I'm free from all men but I, I've made myself a servant to all of them that I might gain the more because the bottom line of everything Paul was doing is that he could win more people to Christ and he said to the Jews I became a Jew that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, were Gentiles, as without law, not lawlessness, but they weren't under the law of God. They, they didn't know about it. Being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that were Gentiles without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do, for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? Now, let's just paraphrase that a little bit. There's a whole bunch of people can enter a marathon. There may be hundreds of them at the beginning, but there's going to be only one person that's going to be the winner in the end. So run that you may obtain. Now, I think what Paul is saying here is that not, not just one Christian is going to make it, but if you're going to run in the race, set your goal to win the race. And if you're going to be a Christian, set your goal to be the best Christian. Sometimes we think our goal ought to be the best Christian I can be. Well, maybe so, but set your goal to be the best Christian that anybody can be. And the perfect example of that is Jesus. Set your goal to be like Jesus as much as you can. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. This is an allusion to the Olympics that Paul watched, I believe. Anybody that's competing in there, he says they're striving for the, the mastery of it. They're, they're, under, they're temperate in all things. I think it means they discipline themselves. Like a good 
athlete does. The root word for discipline is disciple. We're disciplining ourselves for Christianity if we're disciples. Now they do it in the Olympics to obtain a corruptible crown. Their crown was a bunch of laurel leaves wrapped around their head. A few days, I guess that was withered away, wasn't it? But we're striving for an incorruptible crown, one that lasts forever, eternally. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air. <laughs> I remember a few years ago they had those celebrity boxers. Remember that? <laughs> if you've ever watched real boxing, you know, they're disciplined. They know when they're going to punch and when to uncover. I saw Tanya Harding on their box. <laughs> she was as one that beating the air. <laughs> I think that's kind of what Paul means here. He says, if I'm going to be a Christian, I'm going to be disciplined. I'm going to do the best I can. Not just flailing around out there. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Just like an athlete. He says, he's comparing Christianity to athleticism. It involves discipline. It involves uh, training Coming to church and studying the Bible and worshiping, that's part of our Christian training, isn't it? Lest that by any means when I've preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this 1 Corinthians chapter 9. There's a lot in it. We may want to go home and study over it again in the coming days before we come back to study chapter 10. It's in Jesus' name we thank you for it. Amen.